Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Dorothy Roberts, and thank you, everybody, for joining us for this critical discussion. Um, this panel, entitled Building the Ivory Tower, How Institutions Benefited, will be about financial and educational institutions' connections to slavery, what is owed to those who have been harmed, and how to go about seeking redress. If you have questions, please jot them down. We have a few student volunteers that are gonna be walking around with note cards, and you can just write down any questions that you have for the panelists, and then what'll happen is at the, at the end, we'll give about 20 minutes for audience questions, and we'll answer those at that time. And this is gonna help us keep a conversation going with the panelists, and then we'll get to the questions. Um, to start, let me introduce our esteemed panelists that I have with me here. To my right, we have Ms. Sandra Green Thomas. She is a founding member of the GU 272 Descendants Association, of which she currently serves as its president, and the proposed GU 272 Foundation. She is an advocate for reparative measures that address the legacies of enslavement and Jim Crow on people of African descent in the Americas, and has been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and several other news and media outlets. To her right is Professor Carlton Waterhouse. He currently serves as the director of the Indiana University Robert H. McKinney School of Law, Environmental Energy and Natural Resources Program, and leads the legal team representing the legacy of the GU 272 Alliance. He is an international expert on environmental law and justice, as well as reparations and redress for historical injustices. He was recently selected as a Fulbright Fellow to study police violence and social dominance in Brazil. And to his right is Ari Meritazone. He is a reparationist, an ordained minister, and community economic development practitioner. He also serves as the male co-chair for the Philadelphia chapter of the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, or NCOBRA. And our last but not least fine, uh, panelist to Ari's right is <coughs> Professor Sharon Ann Murphy. She is a professor of history at Providence College focusing on the complex interactions between financial institutions and their clients. Her book, Other People's Money, How Banking Worked in the Early American Republic, won her the 2012 Hagley Prize for the best book in business history. And her latest project is an investigation of the relationship between Southern banks and American slavery, particularly the use of slaves as loan collateral. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start, do a brief history of, of the issues that we're gonna talk about and then kind of go into how, um, how we can go about addressing those issues. Um, so to start, um, Professor Murphy, if you can talk about when and why U.S. insurance companies began insuring Africans on behalf of slave owners. So um, insurance on slaves goes way back well before American history. Um, there's evidence of uh, slaves being insured by marine insurance companies on the slave trade. Um, certainly the Zong case is a famous case that a lot of people are uh, familiar with that deals with insurance. Um, in the United States, uh, slave insurance uh, goes hand in hand with the development of the industry. So life insurance um, really began taking off in the 1820s and 30s, and um, early companies uh, were involved in insuring slaves from that early point, um, even though it was very controversial, not from the sense of they don't want to insure slaves because it's immoral, but more, is this gonna be profitable? Is this something we want to um, be investing in? Uh, the big question for most companies was, um, what's the mortality rate on slaves? And, and uh, we don't, th that was actually a problem they had with white lives as well. Um, so they were uh, operating in a, very much in a knowledge gap. Um, but uh, most uh, life insurance started in the Northeast, so uh, slaves were less of an issue. Um, but early Southern companies, the Baltimore Life Insurance Company, its first policy was on a slave. Um, it then uh, kind of veered away from it. It was, uh, did not, despite uh, lots of requests, it did not want to get involved in this. Again, 
not because of moral issues, but primarily because of financial concerns. Um, but eventually, um, due to pressure from um, a lot of uh, slaveholders, particularly urban slaveholders, um, as well as agents who wanted to sell these policies, they um, eventually ended up dedicating a large portion of their business to underwriting um, slaves. Uh, Northern companies were, uh, who went into the South were um, mixed on this. Some companies absolutely would not insure slaves um, or black lives at all. Um, some companies did venture into this area. Um, it's hard to know uh, the numbers because most of these companies are non-existent anymore and so uh, a lot of the records don't exist so it's very hard to know to what extent a lot of this is fragmentary data that we're, we're working with. Um, Probably the best information we have on a northern company is New York Life, which still does exist, and there's been a lot of recent work on, um, on that. Um, and uh, they were trying to get into the insurance business, trying to make a name for themselves, um, and uh, decided that a good way, in order for insurance to work well, they need numbers, and a good way to get numbers quickly was to go south and get some slaves insured. So in their first, in their early years, they insured um, quite a few slaves. Uh, they eventually decided that it, um, in their words, it wasn't profitable um, and got out of it. Um, but by that point, they had enough white lives in the Northeast that, that they were able to maintain their, their business. So this is um, something that, that uh, was both widespread but also spotty who was involved in it. A lot of um, insurance done on slaves was actually fire insurance companies reflecting the idea um, whether slaves were lives or property. And so um, a lot of these were done by local property insurance, com local fire insurance companies where the records are even spottier than on life insurance companies. So there's a long history to, to this. And what was the scale of the profits made? So that's, that's actually really hard to know because our data on um, how much w was made is um, really sketchy. Um, for, uh, and especially because of the nature of life insurance, a lot of it is long term, so trying to, to pin down where the profits come from. Um, so for example, New York Life would say we, it was not profitable and that's why we got out of it. Um, and uh, even though it was really important for establishing their business, so there is, um, still some argument that that was an important precursor to getting them um, established as a company. Uh, certainly Baltimore Life, when it, by the 1850s, it, um, second half of the 1850s, it's, it's more or less dedicating itself to um, uh, underwriting slaves. They seem to think it's, it's profitable. Of course, they're decimated by emancipation because of that. Um, but so, but the, pinning down actual numbers um, is really, really difficult for these companies, especially because most of them, um, the, the records are so, so scattered. And I think that's an issue that the institutions are, that uh, higher institutions of higher education are having as well with Georgetown, if I'm not mistaken, with um, having a number from the number that was sold, uh, that amount that the enslaved people were sold for at Georgetown, if you can speak to that. The actual amount or the actual number of people? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, actual, um, the amount and then kind of the history of what happened at Georgetown. Well, I think they pinned it at, what, 113000 at the time they received for it. And they like to say it's value at $3.3 million currently in today's money. But we all know that's not how money and investments work through time. Also, that was not the only sale. And it, you know, when they first began talking about this, they, they characterized the 1838 sale as Georgetown is getting out of the slavery business. Well, that's not true. Uh, there were sales before, there were sales afterwards, they, were, they acquired more enslaved people. In fact, they applied for um, compensation after emancipation to the um, government, to the federal government, because they had slaves right up until the end of the Civil War. So, you know, there's been a lot of um, misinformation, but as they delve more into the records and, and looking at it instead of just trying to record the history, the early history of Jesuits in this country and seeing it also from the perspective of their human trafficking history as well. 
and dealing with enslaved people, the story is evolving. It still is a story that is developing exactly what they did, how much they benefited. But what you need to understand, I think, with this is that Georgetown has been put out there as, uh, well, they enslaved my ancestors. No, my ancestors were enslaved by the Society of Jesus. Mm, that's right. For the benefit of Georgetown College and other Jesuit institutions. The enslavement of my ancestors allowed the Society of Jesus and the Catholic Church to establish a beachhead here in North America. First Catholic parish, first Catholic uh, college. Also, the proceeds from that sale not only propped up Georgetown, but it was the seed money for other Catholic institutions, which allowed it to spread, Catholicism and the Society of Jesus to spread across North America. So it's much larger. And the resources that a Georgetown has are dwarfed by the resources that the Society of Jesus has. And I would, you know, my personal opinion and the opinion of uh, many who I work with is that really our focus should be on the Society of Jesus for reparative measures. Georgetown has granted legacy status to descendants. That's, that's nice, that's sweet. I really don't think it's appropriate. I mean, uh, someone who has legacy status, they had a parent, a grandparent who went to Georgetown, or they had someone who was a donor to Georgetown. That's all by choice. My ancestors' contribution, very specific, very unique, and it was coerced. I think our status should be founder status, not legacy <laughs> status. And I think that I, we should be going tuition free. I have two children who are now attending Georgetown. It's not free, okay? And that is the misconception that a lot of people have too, that they are being granted tuition. No, my son is gonna carry the same amount of debt he would have if he'd have stayed at LSU. Now he's just going to Georgetown. So um, there are lots of issues here and I think education is the key. People need to be educated on the, on the true nature of slavery, its pervasiveness, in our society, its foundational role. They need to be educated that it was a system that was put in place, laws that were put in place. When you look at the mid 1600s all the way through to 1700, and you look at how incrementally, incrementally black people are being reined in and controlled, poor whites and poor blacks are being divided, they're creating a wedge, you know, they're um, outlawing into marriage, penalizing people with jail time, increases in their indenture, uh, fines, um, banishing people if you decide to intermarry, okay? But also at the same time, establishing, what, what was it, in 1682, Virginia Commonwealth, they established, the, and this is after the Bacon Rebellion and the rebellions in, Ma in Maryland where poor whites and poor blacks are joining together to try to seek redress for government injustice, for exploitation, for living in horrific conditions. After that, to address that, they say, well, how can we create a wedge between these people? Well, first we're gonna make a law that says only people of European descent can be citizens, specifically, and also, if you are of European descent, we're gonna give you 50 acres to help you along the way. Now, to me, that looks like the first entitlement program. We like to talk about entitlement. So if you're white, you're entitled to citizenship, and you're entitled to land. And if you're black, step back. So ultimately, like, like the slave codes in 1705, that gives the master life and death rights over an enslaved body. If during correction, he happens to kill you, so what? No big deal. It encourages poor whites to get in the business of hunting down runaway slaves and incentivize that by paying them. You know, so by the time you get to the beginning of the 18th century, white males in power have basically legislated control over all bodies. Who can sleep with who? Who can have citizenship? Who can own land? And it, the bottom line is, the message is, Benefits accrue to whiteness, 
and penalties are exacted from blackness. And that's, you know, that's the basis of what we're dealing with here today. Benefits accrue to whiteness and penalties are exacted from blackness. So I know that Ari has been or has worked on um, with Encobra on putting together uh, the slavery era business and corporate insurance disclosure. Would you be uh, would you be willing to speak to that? Oh sure, absolutely. That's what I'm here for. Um, but I, mean, I you know, I feel a little stiff right now in the room. I like to do a little icebreaker. Is that all right <laughs> with the group? And uh, it goes like this here: All of if you believe that Afri descendants of African slaves in the United States are old reparation, raise your hand. Okay, look at some, y'all look around, keep your hands up and look around the room. All right, next question. By a show of hands, do you believe that reparations will be in your lifetime or your children's lifetime? That's a problem. Look around the room. That's a problem. Yeah, that's a problem. Look around the room. That's a problem. All right? And uh, so I just want to be able to set the reality for us that we have to have a made up mind about this thing called reparations now. Right? If you don't have a made up mind about reparations now, then you know. You, you need to get in a class called Reparations 101, right? And get a better understanding of why you cannot believe, why you, why you won't do something to make reparations happen now. Those of you who didn't raise your hand on the second question, it's more likely than not, you won't do anything to make reparations uh, happen right now or in the lifetime of your children or, yeah, in the lifetime of your children. So in your lifetime and the lifetime of your children. So that's the problem. That has to be negotiated. Reparation need to stop. We need to take re reparation away from debating and start talking about negotiating. Because right. that's the issue, right? OK, I'm here representing the people, who, the people who are the descendants of African slaves in the United States for short days. And I may mention that over and over again. As, as a resource for this symposium, I will answer questions about Philadelphia slavery disclosure law of 2005, which amended Philadelphia Code 10th edition, section 17104, entitled Prerequisite to the Execution of City Contracts by adding a subsection entitled, and here it is, Slavery Error Business Slash Corporate Insurance Disclosure and Financial Reparations. Now that last two words, financial reparation, was something that we added to the model that came out of Chicago. Chicago was one of the first cities to have slavery disclosure laws. But that's all, all, all the corporations had to do is disclose and go about their business, right? So we said, no, no, not here in Philly, right? And so that we created this, this uh, new subsection that says essentially that after disclosure, the corporation, the insurance company, the business must submit a reparation financial plan, right? That's the, key, that's the key language of the law. But the issue now is enforcement. The city of Philadelphia will not enforce it, right? The procurement department is supposed to be the, uh, in, written up in the, in the law, the procurement department is supposed to be the enforcer. But when we engage them, they shifted us and said, no, it's not us. It's the treasurer of the city. So we go to the treasurer of the city. Oh, no, it's not us. Right? So guess who, who has to enforce it? The citizens of Philadelphia has to enforce that law. Hopefully, the uh, outcome of this particular uh, symposium was that uh, some of the students and the deans and the law, law professors may help us to enforce that law, uh, enforce, enforce the law whereby Corporations, uh, businesses, and insurance companies actually make that financial plan. Ari, how could uh, us as Penn Law students help do that? Say that again? How could we as Penn Law students help enforce oh, this? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, and, and, 
And, and first thing is, you gotta look at some structural thing with the, with the university. The university must add some type of reparations, research, clinic, wherein the law, second year law students actually practice providing services to reparations out in the, in the community. To begin to bridge that gap between enforcement and paying reparations. The bottom line, that's it. Everybody wanna talk about it and debate it, but when you get down to it, some enforcement has to take place. And hopefully, uh, the, the law school here will put together some type of reparations clinic where uh, students can really begin to see and understand what really happened to us, the atrocities that were laid upon us, much like uh, it was already said, both by the professor and my colleague on, the, on my left. So it's important for the university to look at its own structure. And, you know, this, uh, disclosure laws basically around, it deals with that bigger, broader subject called consumer protection, right? That businesses must, and corporations must disclose their predecessor involvement in slaving our people. They must dis disclose that, right? So if they must do that, then this law school, likewise, should disclose its involvement in enslaving descendants of African slaves in the United States. Because, because if I want my daughter, my daughter went to George Washington University Law School, but if she came here, and, and uh, then I would want to talk with her about asking the university to disclose its background, because she may very well want to go someplace else. So that's a, so, so hold on, so that's an element of fraud, right? when you don't disclose really what the deal is right. and, and what you're about, right? So the, 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 the university has to look at its own self around this fraudulent representation of the University of Pennsylvania, formerly known as Philadelphia College, where the enslavers morphed into um, presidents of universities and colleges. The master morphed into these universities. Um, Craig Stephen Wilder, Ebony and Ivy, Race, Slavery, and the Troubled History of America, America's, America's University. Let me read a quick excerpt, very quick, brief. Um, <clears throat> it's basically a review done for this book. Some people call it a linear note. Here we go. The slave economy and higher education grew up together, each nurturing the other. Money from the purchase of the sale of human beings built the campuses, stocked the libraries, and swelled the endowments of American colleges. Slaves waited on faculty and students. Academic leaders eagerly courted the support of slaveholders and slave traders. Ultimately, as Wilder shows, our leading universities were thoroughly dependent on enslavement and became breeding grounds for the racist ideas that sustained it. In short, the American Academy, inclusive of the University of Pennsylvania, never stood apart from the American slavery. It stood beside church and state as the third pillar of a civilization built on bondage. Look in the mirror, folks. Look in the mirror, University of Pennsylvania. And I like, I think somebody has to have some courage. Georgetown, I talked to the president of Georgetown University. And I told him, I said, man, I thanked him, first of all, for his courage to do what he did, the liturgy and all that. But I said, you got to have some courage to represent the enslavers and make amends. And I say the same thing to the University of Pennsylvania. You have to have some courage, Dean, and, and begin to be on the side of the enslaved, right? So it's important for the university to do those type of things. So we know that it's not just enough to disclose what happened, right? So what are, um, Sandra, what is your organization looking at doing, Professor Waterhouse, what is your team looking at doing um, with Georgetown to, to help? Okay, well thank you uh, to begin. Thanks for the invitation to be here and um, I'm uh, very honored to be on such an uh, esteemed panel. 
um, and with the, our luminary, uh, Professor Roberts, as well. Um, and for all of you all who've come out in attendance for such an important uh, event. One of the things I think I'd like to add to, though, this conversation before getting into specific details is a response to something that Professor Roberts raised in her opening remarks. And that is that when we think about slavery and think about life today, we have to think about them in the context. So slavery, when it existed, was not just an institution. Right. It was a manifestation of racial dominance. And so some people confuse the end of slavery with the end of racial dominance. Right. But it actually was not the end of racial dominance. It merely reflected a transformation in the form that racial dominance took. So if you think about it, you can think about water as being in the form of steam, as being in the form of liquid, as being in the form of slush, and being in the form of ice. Just because you don't have steam doesn't mean you don't have water, right? And so what we had is an end of slavery, but not an end of racial dominance. And that's why the segregation system that developed in America was not new after slavery. It was merely the South adopting the Northern segregation practices that had already existed in places where slavery had been brought to an end. That's why when segregation ended in America, there wasn't an end to racial dominance in America. Well, that's the era we're living in right now. We're living in an era where we don't have a name to identify the form, but it's still a manifestation of racial dominance. Now, why is all that important? Because if you talked about an end of slavery while slavery was going on, you were either a very radical person or viewed as being insane like John Brown. Because the idea is slavery is the norm, and every aspect of the society embraced it and legitimated it as a functioning, proper reality. That That's meant right. that the legal system from the Supreme Court all the way down constantly affirmed the legitimacy and the lawfulness of slavery. Well, the same thing happened under segregation. The legal system consistently affirmed <laughs> segregation. And so if you talked about ending it, in many ways, you were viewed as being somebody radical, which is why the NAACP was a radical organization, <laughs> because they were talking about ending segregation. So why is that important today? It's important because if we talk about reparations, we have to begin, I think, with what um, Monroe Little said at the Asala Conference in 2015. He said, isn't reparations what happens after there's an end of a war, after there's a cessation of hostilities? Isn't reparations what follows that? Well, he had to say in America, has there been a cessation of racial hostilities? No. And so you have to think about reparations within the context of recognizing that there continues to be an active onslaught of racial subordination in America. And it is the norm. It's a norm that says the biggest challenge to equality in America is affirmative action. So unless someone talks about race, then there is no racial subordination or discrimination. So we can have mass incarceration. That's right. We can have police violence. We can have glass ceilings. We can have housing discrimination, active employment discrimination, active. All of these are norms that we understand through the statistics. This is life in America. And yet it is as if that's just the way things are naturally. But that's not natural. That is the manifestation or the symptom of racial dominance. And so if we want to talk about reparations, we have to begin with the recognition that we live under a context of racial dominance and that our institutions of higher learning, our legal institutions, our financial institutions, and all of our institutions are currently as much invested in racial dominance as they were invested in slavery and as they were invested in segregation. So reparations for it to be a real manifestation that ends continuing discrimination and continuing subordination has to challenge and acknowledge that when we talk to Georgetown, we're talking about an institution that is grounded and still manifests racial dominance every day. 
And the fact that they establish a institute to study African American life, and the fact that they establish <laughs> a greater amount of money for, uh, you know, for students who are studying African American history, is just like having a plantation owner who decides to give the enslaved an extra day, an extra meal on Sunday. <laughs> it's not the end of the dominance, right? And so we have to continue to think about reparations in the broader context of bringing an end to racial dominance and that reparations becomes the manifestation of a victory right. in that fight. And so when I, we talk about what we're doing with Georgetown, we're providing support to descendants to help them as Georgetown and they negotiate how that's going to look and what that's going to look like. But it's not in any way a... Um, excuse me, an endorsement of the legitimacy of these institutions of racial dominance within which we live and breathe and have our being. So in that sense, we are advocating on their behalf, and in that sense, we're negotiating, but it has to all begin with an idea of deconstructing racial dominance, that's and right. that's the commitment we need that's to right. see from the Tali scholars and from everybody else in this room who thinks that we should have reparations now, well, the people who are benefiting from racial dominance have to decide, like the slave owners, to disinvest from that institution. So, George, so Thomas Jefferson talked about how much he hated slavery and how horrible it was, but he was unwilling to disinvest from all of the benefits that being a slave master gave him. And if we don't have a society of people who are willing to disinvest from the benefits that racial dominance gives them. We could talk about reparations all day, right. but we'll just switch from liquid water to <laughs> slush before we even get to ice, and we'll still be living under the conditions of racial dominance. Can I explain? Uh, um, yeah, I'd like to explain. We'll, we'll get to uh, Sharon, and then we'll come back to you, Ari. OK, good. I, I just wanted to add on to what Carlton was saying, because I think it is really <coughs> important that um, until we understand the conditions, you're not going to convince anyone. And um, so I, I actually want to plug a new book that's out that uh, I know um, a lot of you probably know, Ira, Ira Katz-Nelson's When Affirmative Action Was White, a great book, and uh, obviously Michelle Alexander's Watershed book on the new Jim Crow. Um, there's a new book, um, and I'm, I'm going to massacre the author's name, so I'm not even going to say it, but the book is called The Color of Money, um, and it's by a, a law professor at University of Georgia. And I think it's um, doing a similar thing that um, the new Jim Crow did for mass incarceration, looking at um, the financial institutions since the Civil War and, and what's and not just um, redlining and mortgages and, and all those kinds of things. I think those are the kinds of things that are so important understanding the longer term impact and the continual, as um, the professor was saying in her keynote remarks, the, the longer term impact of how this has played out, um, I think is really essential before you can convince people of the need to redress. And so I just wanted to plug that. It's a, it's a fabulous new book that's out. All right. Yes, I just want to uh, <clears throat> demystify this concept, or what happened to us. I want to demystify that. <coughs> Lest we forget, the United States declared war on us, enslaved us, made us chattel, legal property, public policy, and states' rights ripped us from under the covering of our culture. So they took us from under the covering of God and made us property. That's the essence of it. It was all about peoplehood, first and foremost. Everything else, once they destroyed our peoplehood, everything else followed, right? So we got to deal with the question of peoplehood. And like uh, Dr. Waterhouse, right? He had mentioned in one of his earlier writings that what's needed to advance to get back into court or get back into the public space of morality is to be a, begin to, uh, to, to identify a narrow group of people who was really affected. Because again, the access to the courts standing has been, a, has been a bar for us. So we have identified a, a peculiar people. Everybody heard that term, that term before, right? And that's, those are descendants of Africans enslaved in the United States. No one else have that type of uh, history but us. So with that standing, we must use our agency to put forth 
to identify our status and our standing to get redress for the enslavement of our people. It's very key that we talk about peoplehood and advocate for peoplehood because once we get our peoplehood back, once we begin to stand tall in our culture, then we have access to the courts and, and be more, more particularly can bring issues of morality into the public domain before uh, colleges and universities, corporations, financial institutions, and insurance companies. Those are the ones that we must go after in a local sort of way. Uh, I'm glad you brought up that point about standing. Um, I wanted to get into kind of the legal, um, whether or not there could be a legal case brought against this um, Society of the Jesuits or um, Georgetown itself. And I wanted to kind of talk about um, the case that was brought in against the insurance companies. So in um, from the early to mid 2000s, reparations lawyer Deadria Farmer Paleman had discovered evidence that US insurance companies had previously insured Africans on behalf of their slave owners. She filed a class action reparations suit on behalf of all formerly enslaved Africans and their descendants and all living formerly enslaved African Americans <coughs> and their descendants. The lawsuit demanded over one trillion dollars from numerous major corporations including Aetna and Bank of America. The district court dismissed this case largely on the basis that the plaintiff did not have standing to sue and the statute of limitations had long expired. And the Seventh Circuit Court largely affirmed the district's court holding and found that it would be impossible by the methods of litigation to connect the defendant's alleged misconduct with the financial and emotional harm from the plaintiff's claim to have suffered as a result of that conduct. Furthermore, the Seventh Circuit Court reasoned that suits complaining about injuries that occurred more than a century and a half ago have been barred for a long time by the applicable state statutes of limitations. It is true that tolling doctrines can extend the time to sue well beyond the period of limitations, but not to a century or more. So um, do you think that these would be obstacles for a legal claim brought against um, the society or against Georgetown itself? Anybody? Um, well, I'm not a lawyer, first of all. But I think that in our particular situation, um, I, I hear there's, there have been a lot of obstacles to these suits based upon not being able to have standing, you know, no, no specifically. But we have had direct chains with documentation, many of it kept by the Society of Jesus, where the enslaved people, such as people in my family, are referred to by their first and last names. There are sacramental records. There are marriage records. The, all of these records, and also there's the, um, the Articles of Agreement, where families are described in family groups, names, people. They go on to the ship manifest. They go through sales and successions. But remarkably, most of them are in family groups. So we do have this direct chain uh, do, through legal documents. That's accepted right. legal documents. They're specific individuals. I can trace my family back. In fact, when I made the discovery of their connection, it was simply because I knew the name of my great-great-grandparents, and all I had to do was look at the articles right. of agreement, and I saw them there listed with their children. It was just that simple. So, I mean, I know many African Americans don't have that. In a way, we're fortunate that we were enslaved by the Society of Jesus because they <laughs> kept really great records. <laughs> and then my family continued to be Catholic, and so once we got to Louisiana, you know, everybody's getting married and baptized, and all those records are in the Red Books. You can go to any public library, and you can trace my family through the Catholic Red Books. But, um, so I think that obstacle has been removed as far as uh, prescription, I guess that's what you're referring to. Uh, I think Mr. Waterhouse should take that question. Okay. okay. So I guess I would say the legal bar to reparations suits is like the legal bar to desegregation suits. I mean, Blessed versus Ferguson, right? What was the legal bar to challenging segregation? It was the fact that the racist justices were not going to say it was not lawful. 
what was the what was the bar to the Supreme Court? All the challenges before the Supreme Court against slavery. They said it's it's an essential part of our uh, society. We can't bring it into it. So to some degree, it's only a bar if the society doesn't believe it has legitimacy. That's the real core issue. The law doesn't prevent any of this. Laws are made up by people. That's right. We're, we, have an, we had an equal protection clause that said people had to be get treated equally under the law, and we had a robust system of segregation that clearly didn't treat people equally under the law. So, no, there's not a real legal problem. There's a social problem. That's right. Right? And that social problem is social dominance, right? And the fact that the dominant group is not invested in allowing subordinated people to use legal tools to challenge their subordination. So in Oklahoma, where we had had the Tulsa uh, race riot, right? And blacks who had been killed and shot down and whites who were deputized to do the killing, and they brought a suit and they had people who were survivors of the riot itself. These are the actual victims who brought the suit. And they said, oh, we just got the records from the city of Oklahoma because they had kept them hidden. And they had a commission and they re revealed all this information. And so we should be able to bring a suit now for reparations, right? Charles Ogletree and uh, Al Brophy and others, Ajwa Ayatoro and others who brought this suit. And the judge said, well, you do have standing, but there's a problem of latches. Mm. So you waited too long to bring the suit. You couldn't have brought it right after it happened, but you probably should have brought it somewhere in the 1960s. <laughs> so even though you have the person who was harmed, you have a legal, we have a legal theory that we can use to justify denying you. And there's no end to the legal theories that the court could decide to use to justify denying a reparations claim. Now, as a lawyer and as a law professor, will I say there are bases to bring a reparations claim on behalf of the descendants of Georgetown? Yes, it exists right there in DC, right? And there are some legal theories that can be used in DC to challenge what Georgetown has done that I think if you have a fair-minded judge could potentially bring about a successful result for the descendants. But that's gonna go up to the Supreme Court. Yeah. So whether or not you have a legal theory, it doesn't matter what are the nine justices going to Supreme Court do. Well, based on what they've done around all racial cases since the 1970s, I could say right now they would rule against us. So unless there's a change to that dynamic in the society about what the expectations are around race and subordination and law, I think it's a hard case to win. But that's not because there's no law to support a victory. That's, that's right. because there's no political will to support a victory. That's right. And, and so therefore, we also must move the issue back into the public domain. And it should be led by institutions like the, like the University of Pennsylvania, who've had that predecessor involvement. You got to take the lead. You got to come and sit on the other side of the table. Let us talk about how to, right? Somebody in amongst you got to have the courage to do that just to talk to reparationists about how do we uh, correct this monstrous destruction of life, monstrous destruction of culture, and human possibilities. So I hope Dean, uh, and let me get his name right. <laughs> and, and, hey, look, look here, I, I'm, say, I'm, 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 I'm pretty much selecting him because you know I used to work for two deans called Gene and Edgar Kahn, and I was the, uh, manager of the teaching law firm, hence my use of this, the notion of clinics and practice, right? And so, so it's, you, have, you have to wrestle with the powers that be inside this institution if you really want to be involved with shifting uh, the perspective of people that reparations will never be paid. It will be because the people will make that decision. But I don't have the, I don't, I don't personally, in corporate, don't have enough juice right now, right? But universities, colleges, financial institutes, they have the juice. So how do we make them use that for the better good, the ultimate good? That's the big battle. As I said, the courts have never been closed to us, it's just the minds have been closed. And it's not just a victory, it's, it's I'm glad they brought the Plessy case. That's right. I'm glad they brought the Dred Scott case. 
even though they quote unquote didn't win, it was very important symbolically to show the injustice that the court was supporting and also became a mark that other lawyers could come along to try to dismantle. So it's not a matter of should we bring a case because we will win. Right. Even if we don't win, that doesn't mean we shouldn't bring a case. That's right. Right? right, because it's an injustice. We have a court system that's supposed to acknowledge and address injustices. We have a right to bring it. We should bring those kinds of cases when necessary, irrespective of what is necessarily going to be the outcome in terms of a judgment. Uh, and Sandra, can you speak to um, the organization that you're president of and kind of what you're working on as well? Well, we've been trying to. Um initially started with Georgetown University and moved on to the Society of Jesus in order to try to work with them to, um, oh, sorry, I <laughs> didn't realize you couldn't hear me. I said we started really with um, trying to have talks and negotiate with Georgetown University and we've expanded it really to the Society of Jesus in order to try to put together a foundation that would support the educational and economic aspirations of descendants and also educate the uh, general public on slavery and the legacies of Jim, Jim Crow. And, um, and also with the descendant organization, what we really focused on with that is reuniting families. I mean, I talked about just a minute ago about my family being intact, but that's the direct line. I mean, from this, I discovered that, you know, uh, my great, uh, great grandmother had a brother whose family was sent to another parish. So personally, I've reconnected with people that are my cousins that I never knew as a result of this. And we're doing a lot of work trying to bring families together. We have families that are all around the world, mm. you know, even in China that are connected to this. So uh, that's the work of the Descendant Organization and tr also trying to, um, Descendant Association also trying to keep the media focus on this. We found that um, we get more response from the Jesuits and Georgetown University when they receive bad press. So, <laughs> you, know, after, you know, after a little bad press, then we get another uh, minor concession, we get another meeting, right. you, know, you know, we take the negotiating process, which is going really at a snail's pace. I mean, well, that's even saying it's going faster than it is. But it gets to move along a little bit after things like this. And that's why I'm glad it's being streamed and it's going to be shared. I know I'm certainly going to share it with all my contacts and media people. And we may see a little movement after this as well. So, um Recently, an article was published in the Daily Pennsylvanian. It was earlier this month. Um, and it was um, an independent student-run newspaper, is the Daily Pennsylvanian. And they published preliminary findings of the Penn History of Slavery Project. Penn um, has consistently said that there is no connection to slavery at this university. and. Um, the Penn History of Slavery Project was a group of undergraduate students who started a couple months ago researching the um, archives uh, in and around Philadelphia. And what they found was that out, they looked at 28 trustees out of 126 founding trustees. So they've, they've only scratched the surface. But out of 28 of those trustees, 20 of them held enslaved people and had financial ties to the slave trade. The university itself as an institution has not yet been implicated, but the students involved in this project are continuing their research. They're gonna continue looking into what's been going on. So what could other institutions of higher education learn? I know that we kind of talked about different ways to get involved, but what could they learn? What could some of the obstacles be that they could face going to the university? I know that they've already um, had one talk with the university and nothing's come out of that yet, but what, you just have to do more investigation. This story, I predict, is going to evolve the same way the Georgetown story has evolved. Once you get more investigation, you get more information, you bring more attention to it, then that puts the fire behind, under their behinds. And that's, it's just that simple. And you, and you know what? And we have to rely on you students for that. 
that's how the Georgetown story came out. I mean, Georgetown discussed this, uh, their involvement in enslavement for decades, only in academic circles. But once the kids occupied the president's office and the media got a hold of it, then something was done. So it's really up to you guys to get that story out there. Yeah, uh, well, look here. I don't know what those researchers were looking at, to tell you the truth. But do you know un what's under Franklin Field? It's an ancestral burial ground. Right? Don't, so, so it's where you get your information from, what you really want to look, look at. So it's right here on the campus of the University of Pennsylvania. So, hey, y'all, somebody got to take the leadership on the other side of the table. I'm on one side, but the other side also got to take some leadership here. And if you don't, then the public will come after you, right? And because the public is getting more and more educated about what happened to us, and they don't like it. And so to, to minimize the tensions, the president of this college must come forth, encourage its professors to engage with in COBRA and talk about negotiating ways and means that we can solve this problem. We can't do it in two hours. Can't do it in an hour. But we, it's got to be ongoing negotiations, right? It must be done in, with some ethics involved, some morality involved, and we can solve the problem. But hey, if y'all don't come forward, stand a hand across the table, we're going to be going around this circle over and over again. And uh, that's not good because soon, just like the abolitionist John Brown took upon himself to do some radical uh, action, uh, the descendants of of African slaves in the United States will likely do the same thing. Let me just note that you know, students really have the power. That's right. They really do. Whether it's Brown, whether it's Georgetown, mm -hmm. wherever, the students are the ones who are the movers. That's right. And the, the people who run the institution aren't invested in actually, you know, bringing a big wedge between them and their students. So when students make this a priority, it will become a priority for the university. There you go. The buildings were renamed at Georgetown because the students wanted the buildings renamed. They pushed the issue. If the students here push the issue, do the research, build a coalition of groups, invest in this issue because you care about whether your institution has this legacy. When you care about whether this institution has this legacy, then the institution can start caring about that legacy. If you don't care, you got, I've got UPenn, I graduated UPenn behind my name, I'm gonna get a good legal job, I'm gonna work for this firm, I'm not worried about that. You know, if that's your attitude, then you continue to benefit from racial subordination and dominance, and you continue to perpetuate it. That's right. It's all in students' hands. And I, I, you know, I want to say yesterday, uh, Bernice King, MLK's youngest, was speaking at my college, and um, I had the privilege of seeing her. And one of the things she stressed, and I think this is important for the students, because I do think it is the students, um, is that this is also um, the importance of organizing, but also the importance of thinking long term. And that if you're constantly focused on immediate success, you're going to be frustrated, you're going to be burnt out, and um, the importance of building a long term. Um, sometimes you're going to get immediate successes and sometimes it's going to take some time and you're just going to have to keep building at it and keep plugging. It may not be you, it may be the next set of students that actually sees the success. And so um, the importance of, 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 of not looking for that short-term victory but the, the long-term right. building and goal. Um, if the students were to encounter um, opposition from the university, what are some suggestions that you would have for them? Occupy the office of the president. <laughs> That's, right. That's a time-honored strategy. <laughs> As a former student organizer, That's right. um, in, in, in all honesty, if students raise education about the issue on campus, have events, bring speakers, do the research, That's put right. it in the newspaper, Thank ask you. for meetings with the administration, get the administration to acknowledge the issue, get them to establish a committee, establish a commission, 
Those are the traditional student ways of bringing about change. Students have so much power that they don't realize it. They gained it in the 60s and then they kind of gave it away in the 80s, right? Um, and so it's just a matter of putting those honor strategies, as she said, in place and bringing about those changes. Uh, Ari, are there any obstacles that you faced when you were bringing about the uh, slave era codes here in Philadelphia that could translate or that you would like to talk about? <clears throat> well, you know, it started in 2005. I mean, it started a little bit before 2005. The law got in place in 2005. And nothing has happened since then. So it's the, the running away from the law itself by the elected officials, the city proper, right? So we have to, and we will continue to deal with the city now, and we, and we will move, make some enforcement moves ourselves. But why do we have to do that alone is the question. And uh, so University of Pennsylvania, as I continue to raise that name, needs to come out of its our ivory tower, right? and engage themselves with reparationists to close that circle of abolition. You know, there was a group of folks calling themselves abolitionists, right? But now, in this day, we must, the reparationists must close the circle and repair the damage. And that is what I put on the table of this university. It's interesting, Benjamin Franklin actually was a former slave owner. Right. But he also became an abolitionist. And he argued to free people from being in bondage and not to provide them with education, material wealth, and oppor employment opportunities was a tragedy and a horrible insult and harm. And it seems to me that as a country, we all know that that's the legacy of enslavement here, much less the legacy of Jim Crow. And so there has to be some decision to honor the principles of great luminaries like Ben Franklin, who argue that this is an important issue in his day and it remains an important issue today. There are examples and models to look to from the past for this university and others to say this is, a, this is an old issue that demands new attention. Um, so while insurance companies and higher education institutions can never entirely compensate for the harm that they have afflicted on the African community, what other steps can they take now in order to begin helping make victims whole again? And open to, to every, all the panelists. I, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a really hard question and I think um, uh, for me, I think financial institutions, it would, uh, the, if, they, if they focus just on the historic direct connections, they're gonna be able to get off really qu easy because, it, you know, the, because the evidence is so sketchy and so little. Um, I, I would prefer that they focus more on the more recent um, types of 20th century wrongs that were inflicted as opposed to slave era wrongs, because I don't, I don't think that's gonna, uh, I, like I said, I think that's gonna get them off too easily, um, and focus more on how they can correct um, a, a lot of the um, financial harms that were done through, um, through the white supremacy practices and the, um, the redlining and all those ki kinds of things and finding really concrete ways um, that they can reach out into communities and correct those wrongs. But I'm a historian, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, contemporarily speaking, let's start with my mother and my father and her mother and her father. We have a family album. We can identify all of them, right? And so what we need is a louder voice to uh, push back on that loud voice out there that's saying that we'll never pay reparations. In fact, Wachovia Bank, in its, disclave, in its disclosure statement, said we'll never, we're not gonna pay reparations, pure and simple. And that's a very arrogant attitude, of course. But again, we look at the contemporary vestiges of slavery. Look how mass incarceration has affected, every, affected our people. Look at how drugs have affected our people. Look at the denial of education 
has affected our people over time. So I would like to bring a case where it involved these 70-year-olds, 80-year-olds, 90-year-olds, right? We have to go all the way back to the 1800s, 1700s. Just look at the day. In fact, I, would, I hope to be, I'm 70 years old, right? So I'm going to bring it, you know, right? So there you go. It's right here in front of us. We just got to look at it and make up, have a made-up mind that we're going to do something to change it. That's the first step. Then we move in and continue to uh, file the lawsuits, engage in public discussion and debate uh, about negotiating the deal. Yeah, generational trauma. Yeah, well, right, right. Generational trauma. That's current day, right? But so, I, th I think one problem is that if you ask the average person, you know, so you said Wachovia will never pay reparations. You ask the average person, they have a very, very simplistic understanding of what reparations means. Um, and so the, the very complex definition we got at the beginning, um, where there's so many ways repar reparations can take form, they think it's just, just a cash payout. That's the only way to do it to individuals. And so it, it's very easy for, for, for some people to just shut that down. Um, so I think part of the education is, is education about the myriad ways that reparation forms reparations can take that it's not there's not, not just 40 acres and mule That's there's right. there's other ways that it can come come about i think that some of this is is a linguistic problem right, right. with with the public it's about community yeah. economic development more than a check it's about community economic development human well, capital yeah. development you know there's nothing wrong with the check and i think <laughs> people's <laughs> resistance got to be a little bit people's more than resistance a check. people's resistance to that has to do with a lack of knowledge and education about slavery and the role it played in the foundation of this country, about those segregationist policies that kept us as an underclass and an exploited workforce. They really don't know the extent to which black people have been exploited in this country. They really don't because, and we're ignorant all of us, even black people don't understand That's it. That's right. We're ignorant and we're ignorant by design, right. okay? But so in order to maintain the white power structure, you can't have a system where everybody understands what's really going on. You know, I mean, you talk about Plessy versus Ferguson. I'm from New Orleans and I know Homer Plessy's great grandson. <laughs> I'm friends with him. All right. You talk about, I'm going to use my mother as an example. You brought up parents. It made me think about this. Now, when Plessy versus Ferguson came about, you have separate but equal. You're supposed to have equal accommodations for everybody, okay? But separate by race. My mother, when she was a little girl, she wanted to become a registered nurse. All right. In the state of Louisiana, they should have provided a nursing school for her as an African American to become a registered nurse. No, she could become an LPN, but there were no schools for her to attend as a registered nurse. And, uh, well, she could have gone to Dillard, but that's a private institution that costs money. She had been, her father died when she was 10 years old. They didn't have that money. So what she was forced to do was to leave the state of Louisiana and go to Georgia in order to become a registered nurse. Now, that was ridiculous, too. In Georgia, they did provide a, education for colored, as she was, they were referred to then, um, women who wanted to become RNs, but they had a situation where it's, you know, segregation, it's the South, well, it's everywhere. So how, how they solved their problem of creating equal, ac equal accommodations was they had two state-sponsored nursing schools in Atlanta, and one for the whites and one for the coloreds. And they took all of their classes together, but there was a rope up the middle of the auditorium. So the black girls were on the left side, the white girls were on the right side, and when they graduated, they got diplomas that said different names. That's how they settled their equal accommodation problems, okay? All right, Louisiana never did, all right? So. Well, I'm, just, I, I'm not saying that a check is a problem. Yeah. What I'm saying is, what good's a check if the water hasn't changed? If, oh. it's, if, if the systems are still there. So, in oh. some ways, oh, no, the it's part, be it's, the easy yeah. thing to yeah, do. Yeah, but it's part of yeah. a comprehensive yeah. approach but I'm saying, we to have reparations. To think, we have to think much yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, no, it's part. Yeah. Yeah. It's part. I want to add that I, I 
actually don't think um, it's. I Me, mean, ignorance is part of it, but fundamentally, oh, it's it's it's, white it's not. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> not. It's not ignorance, right? So reparations is a dirty word when it has to do with black people. I mean, let's. That's I mean, right. you have to be very clear. There's reparations in Rwanda, there's reparations in South Africa, there's reparations in Peru, there's reparations in Brazil, there's reparations in Chile, there's reparations in Bosnia. It's not controversial, right? What's controversial is reparations for black people. That's controversial in Jamaica, it's controversial in England, it's controversial in Africa. It has to do with white racial dominance because it implies that there is some responsibility that contemporary societies have for the legacy of white racial dominance. And it's a very powerful legacy that actually props up contemporary white racial dominance. And so people do feel a certain kind of way when you talk about it because there's a sense like, am I implicated in this equation? Whereas if we're talking about Germany and Jewish people, and even if we're talking about broken treaties and the Cherokee, and even if we're talking about interned Japanese, people can distance themselves from that. But there's a problem distancing ourselves from the black reparations issue. So it's very controversial, and we know all the reasons why it could never work. From the Dave Chappelle skit to uh, you know, the Ku Klux Klan. All the reasons it can't work, not legally, not logistically, not financially, not politically, but there's really just one reason why it can't work. And once we address that reason, we'll figure out all of the other things. And I, I hate to cut this conversation, but um, I wanted to get to some audience questions. And if you still have questions while we're answering these questions that I have here, please get a note card and we can try to answer them as best we can. Um, so the first question, and it doesn't seem to be to a particular person, um, must reparations be paid to individuals? Should these reparations be instead invested to build public institutions and public benefits tailored to and for the African or black community at large, like higher education, housing, et cetera? It's not an either or question. I actually wrote my dissertation on that subject. And in it, I argue for the creation of three trust funds that would allow for education, economic, and political development. Because slavery and segregation were generational wrongs, what I argued is that there needed to be generational remedies that would last beyond one generation. So the creation of trust funds would be that they would be endowed to the degree that they could continue to provide benefits over generations. That's essential, but that doesn't actually mean there can't also be individual levels of compensation. Uh, the, the reparations program coming out of Germany was comprehensive. It wasn't just one thing. There are four or five different manifestations of that reparations program. So it should be, as she said, both and. I'm assuming your dissertation is available online? It is available Would you like online. to give the title just for the individual who wrote this question? Called The Full Price of Freedom. Full Price of Freedom by Professor Carlton Waterhouse. In case you're the one who wrote this or anybody else who might be interested. You know, um, I think that um, there must be some targeting of some the resources. And that targeting of those reparation resources into those commissions must be must deal with human capital development. That's what was destroyed in our people, right? All those types of things that make people whole again, make them feel good about who they are. Right? and be recognized on an even scale like everyone else. So we can target that, those resources into commissions that are managed by and facilitated by reparations, quote unquote, then we have a great chance of changing the whole dynamic of this country, right? So it's how we use those resources, and they first must go to human capital development is my position. Okay, um, and this is about the responsibility of the Society of Jesus. Um, so the current Pope is a Jesuit. Hmm. Has he been approached regarding this issue? And if not, 
Could you see that going there? Yes, he has. <laughs> has there been a response? Yes, there has. <laughs> Am I going to share it with you? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> well, well, of course. It's, this is a work in progress. Yes, this is sensitive at this stage. Thank you. Well, let me say, too, that uh, a cohort of uh, reparationists from in Cobra met with President Kinseki, who's the Jesuit leader here in the North America and Canada. And we met with him for one whole hour in his office along with his uh, chief of staff. And the bottom thing that we left there with and that the University of Pennsylvania can also do is get the language right in your text. Lift us up one more time as humans, right, in the text. And then that, because students are studying, and if you keep on using this term slaves and slaves, hey, look, look. We're the origin of civilization. We're the mathematicians that put it in place, right? We're the scientists. We're the philosophers that everybody built upon and expanded upon. So it has to go into the text. And he, well, he's still running, but we're still chasing him as well. <laughs> so what is that? Could you go ahead and press through? What would be the correct language rather than slaves? Enslaved. We are descendants of Africans enslaved in the United States, enslaved in Great Britain, enslaved in Jamaica, enslaved. <laughs> Enslaved, it brings back the humanity. And that's what these universities has to do. It has it in its power to do it. And uh, you know, again, it rests with the students. Students in Cobra, Philadelphia chapter meets every first, every first Tuesday, 1609, Cecil B. Moore. I hope some of the students come out and sit with us because then we can create that table, right? that we can then engage this university in a better sort of way, right? And then use that as a model to engage these other universities and these other corporations. But we can design the approach. So this next question, concretely, how do we disinvest from the benefits of racial dominance? So I would begin by saying, first you have to acknowledge it and acknowledge that you are a beneficiary and to denounce the legitimacy of that system, to acknowledge that the discrimination, or excuse me, the disparities in housing, the disparities in wealth, the disparities in employment, the disparities in education are the result of a system of domination. They're not the result of an inferiority right. in the people and then begin to build a policy agenda around those issues or one of those issues and make that a commitment of your life. It's like, how would you fight against slavery during uh, you know, the uh, uh, era of um, enslavement? You have to become an abolitionist. That's right. How did you fight against segregation in the Jim Crow era? You had to work with people who were challenging segregation as illegitimate. And that meant there had to be risk, and that meant there had to be sacrifices. Right. None of these systems were ended without people making sacrifices. Black, whites, natives, Asians, Latinos, others. We have to take risk and make sacrifices, or else we have to say, look, I'm the, my father is a plantation owner, and I eat high on the hog because of it. Mm -hmm. And just accept it, acknowledge it, and roll on. Don't consider yourself an abolitionist at the, high, at the top of the plantation system, right? So you have to locate yourself in this era. Where are you on this fight? Are you supporting the continued dominance? Are you challenging it through your regular daily engagements, through your political engagements, through your educational practices? Uh, this one is for Sandra. What exactly is Georgetown offering students like your children? What is the hypocrisy or the myth involved in misinformation and lies? And who perpetuates the misinformation besides uh, Georgetown and the media? That's a lot of questions. We, we can take the first one. Can I have the card? Yes. <laughs> okay. 
let's see, the first question is what exactly, okay, legacy status is just like legacy status at any other university. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, legacy status is, their legacy status is just like the legacy status at any uh, other university. They get additional points on the application point system in order to receive admittance. All right, the next question is, what is the hypocrisy involved? And misinformation. Well, the misinformation basically is um, through not them not being explicit with their alumni or with the media as to exactly what legacy status is. I've been at. I was at a cocktail party, <coughs> and I'm overhearing some Georgetown alumni in New Orleans discuss this issue, and they didn't know I was a descendant. And I just had to step in and said no, because they were saying, well, you know, they're, uh, those kids are going to Georgetown. They're going for free. They're giving them, you know, I don't know what they're up in arms about. They're giving them free tuition, and they're giving them admittance. And, and I was just like, no, slow down. And I've seen it represented in print and in news uh, broadcasts that what these people, well, what my children and Millison is another person who's there, what they are receiving is admittance and free tuition, and that is incorrect. In fact, I have a little Georgetown student right there if she wants to tell you what she's getting from Georgetown, <laughs> besides an education. Anyway, but, uh, but um, so, and I think they, they don't, they don't, they haven't said that they're given tuition, but that is the implication by their silence. They allow that story to be perpetuated even though it's not accurate, you know? And let's see. And who perpetrates it? Well, I mean, perpetuates it. I just said Georgetown by silence and the media. And people are just quick to snatch bits of information and not really examine things thoroughly. And so you get this, you know, impression that is not exactly accurate as to what Georgetown is providing to descendants. Okay, I hope I answered it sufficiently. <laughs> How does genocide by ecocide factor into the adjudication of reparations for people injured under corporate and higher education actors? Well, that's a statement of fundamental truth that what, what happened to us Genocide, social side, e uh, echo side, all those things, right? And let me just tell the group here, you know, we got to put some value on the R word. You all can do, help us do that by using the term reparation on a regular basis, right? Use it in your vocation. Discuss it in your vocation every day, right? And don't be afraid to, to become a reparationist. And you don't have to look like me to do that. Right? You can do it in your own community. Talk about repar rep reparations across the dinner table. Talk about it on the job, at the water cooler. Those are the type of things how you begin to change society. Right? And we, we got to play the long game. Right? And then we're going to have to refine and refine it. I want to make, give you a reference too, uh, to a website called Race, Racism, and the Law by... Um, yeah, Vernelia Randall, mm -hmm. professor of law emerite from Dayton University, right? Go to that site because we're talking about having the ability to define ourselves for ourselves, and that's the power of change, right? And so that's where the direction must come. And we don't have to get into no tension about that, right? We don't have to get into no tension about just trying to do the right thing, do good, right? and feel comfortable about the R word, reparations and reparationists, wear it. That's what I, I will end with on that note. And I know earlier we talked about the makeup of the Supreme Court and how that's gonna influence one way or the other, how this case, if it's brought, will turn out. Um, and we know that the makeup of the Supreme Court is affected by who is in the president's seat. Um, so voter turnout in the 2016 election um, that put President Donald Trump in the White House was especially poor among African Americans and Hispanic voters and among 18 to 25 year olds. What about getting people to the polls to 
get their ideas in that space? Well, I'll just note that the Supreme Court is one of the reasons the presidency is such an important position. And I know a lot of people are disinvested in the political process because they feel like, well, whoever the president is, we still got slavery. Whoever the president is, we still have segregation, right? And so they feel that reality, and that's not wrong. There are certain realities that are not gonna change whether you have Barack Obama or Donald Trump in office, right? Neither of them changed the nature of mass incarceration. Neither of them changed the disparity in wealth. Neither of them changed the disparity in housing. Neither of them changed the disparity in education. So there's some sense that, which is really founded, like what difference does it make? But there's another sense in which you have to be more sophisticated to realize that if you change the nature of the Supreme Court, you change the nature of the judiciary, you do make change easier. You don't create the change itself, you just make it easier to create the change in the future. So it is important that people vote and political um, organizing at the local level mm -hmm matters and political organizing in the state at the state level and at the federal level we have to raise a level of political consciousness of the people who want to produce change in their level of engagement not because it will necessarily produce the result they want but because it will enhance their capacity to be a change agent in the society Um, is racial dominance perpetuated because it is a dominance of cultural and religious beliefs over a group where cultural and religious beliefs are diametrically opposed to the dominant culture? Um, okay, so racial dominance, I wanna encourage you if you're interested in the subject to read the book, Social Dominance by a Sidanius um, a Prato. Uh, by Sedanius, Jim Sedanius and Felicia Preto. It's a book that explores how societies have groups who dominate other, other members of the society. Uh, social dominance works because it has institutions that replicate it. For example, the police system and the criminal justice system in America replicate social dominance because it takes, uh, for example, in particular African American males as a subordinated group, and it continues to disproportionately distribute to them negative uh, harms in the society by incarceration, punishment, arrest, detention, all of that. But at the root On, of it, it's all economics. It's economics at the root. Social of it. dominance shows that it's not all economics all because right. if you go to societies historically, before the dominance of capitalism today, you still had social dominance. Gender dominance, religious dominance, dominance based on class, dominance based on guild. Economics is one of the premier manifestations of social dominance, but social dominance that we're talking about could be race in America, it could be tribe in South Africa, it could be religion, whether you're Protestant or Catholic in uh, Northern Ireland, uh, it could be whether you're Han or another Chinese ethnic group in China. There are different identity functions that impact what your opportunities are in societies, and that's what social dominance is about. It has different manifestations in different societies, and so in some places, economics, class, some places race, some places gender, some places all those things mixed together. Well, I think here in the United States, the whole construct of race, whiteness and blackness, has its roots in economics. It has its roots in economics. What a small class of white males were trying to do here is to get a, a, a colony up and running and to make it successful. In order to do that, they had to have an oppressed class of people whose labor they could exploit so that they could achieve economically. And they had to build a system in order to keep these people down so that they could benefit economically. I think in this country, the whole notion of race and if you look at it early on, when, when notions of whiteness and blackness are first even mentioned in like the Virginia Commonwealth, it's all tied to economics. It's people trying to make a success of this colony. So. Imbram, uh, Imbram um, X. Kendi, I think I have that right, wrote the book Stamped from the Beginning, which is an excellent genealogy of racism in America, and I want to encourage everyone to look at it. Cornell West dealt with this his book in his first chapter of his book, Prophesied Deliverance, the Genealogy of Racism. It's an old debate, race, class, whatever, which is more important. Is it Marx? Is it more? 
I'll do, my only argument is that it's multifaceted and it has different manifestations, but to attack it, you have to be mindful of all the different tentacles. You can't just beat the octopus by getting one tentacle because then something else will pop out and slap you on the other side. So it is economic, but it's also race, and it's also gender, and it's also religion, and it's also sexual identity. And all of these things are different manifestations of social dominance. Well, I'm not saying that you're wrong. What I'm saying is that all of those constructs arose out of a desire for a small group of people to prevail and succeed economically. I'm not saying, I'm it not saying. It was actually to have power yeah, over yeah, other yeah, people. Yeah. Economic power was just one manifestation of that power, but it also manifests itself in religion and in gender, irrespective of the economic class of the other religious and gender people. So I'm just saying that it's multifaceted and we could debate this actually in papers and books and in panels for years, right? Uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to stop here because this, <laughs> and I know it was, yeah. Um, so I just wanted to just real quick, can each panelist, and we're going to start with Sharon, just say one thing that you think is the most important thing people should learn from what's happened and from this conversation that just took place? Um, I mean, I think the most important thing is the, the enduring generational legacy and continued social problems that, that are embedded in the systems, that this is not, a, um, this is not just something that happened and ended, um, but that it's, it's the, the, the continuation of it through time, the impact. Ari? Well, first of all, we just have to accept that the reality that uh, while and I agree with the sister that while the reparation was, was billed as an economic piece and that the um, monstrous destruction of life, uh, culture, and, 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 uh, and human possibilities were like collateral stuff. So we got to flip that, right? And, and it's important for us to do that on a regular basis, daily talking and moving the discussion into the public domain. Get it out of the ivory tower. Put it into the public domain. Let's have these discussions in an open forum, public forum, on a regular basis, right? And uh, so all that will help. So I'm thinking that we need to create the negotiation table in the final analysis. I just want to thank you again for the opportunity to be here. And I think we can learn from having a panel built on people who are activists, people who are scholars, and, and, and academics can learn that you, we don't have all of the answers. We need to learn things from people who are engaged in this as a part of their daily lives. And that as a result of the, us coming together, we're, more, we're stronger and we have a greater capacity. So let's model and mirror this in our daily uh, engagement with trying to accomplish and bring about social justice? I think the most important aspect of the um, panel today is uh, really our appeal to you all to educate yourselves and to act. Educate yourselves on this issue and act. You know, I mean, you know, together we're all separate fi fingers, but if we put our hands together, we make a fist and we can strike a mighty blow. <laughs> it sounds corny, but it's true. Right. It's true. It's true. So I think that that's the most important thing. You all should educate yourselves, come together in groups, and act. Right. Thank you. Thank you all, and let's thank our panelists.